today I wanted to tell you, yes, about Agent Zero, Agent Zero and generative social science. Um, Mainly, I want to tell you about this new theoretical entity, Agent Zero, recently published by Princeton University Press, Agent Zero Toward Neurocognitive Foundations for Generative Social Science. Um, it's the third book, I see it as the third book in a trilogy on agent-based modeling, the first of which was the novel, as Wander says, uh, Growing Artificial Societies, um, which was really a sort of exploratory work, and then another book, Generative Social Science Studies in Agent-Based Computational Modeling, which is a collection of much more focused explanatory exercises, the reconstruction of an ancient civilization, generating epidemics, civil violence, economic classes. Uh, and then this book, uh, Agent Zero, and the idea is to develop a cognitively plausible agent as a foundation for generative explanations in the social sciences. And what do I mean by a generative explanation? Um, if you have some social regularity, a macroscopic pattern, um, to me, an explanation is a demonstration. To, to explain it in this generative sense, you need to demonstrate how the pattern could emerge on time scales of interest to humans in a population of cognitively plausible agents. So you have some micro specification, an agent world. Does it generate the macroscopic explanandum, a wealth distribution, a migration pattern, an epidemic dynamic, what have you? Uh, and if the micro specification generates it, then that micro specification is an explanatory candidate. So the bumper sticker version of the philosophy is for any X, if you didn't grow it, you didn't explain it. Not the converse, where there might be a lot of ways to grow it and you have to do more work deciding which of them is the more plausible, maybe by designing experiments or collecting data or doing all the other things, doing things that any other science would do in adjudicating among competing explanations. And there might be many micro specifications. So generative sufficiency in this sense is a necessary condition for explanation. But this is a radically different notion than the game theoretic notion of explanation, where I have a pattern, what's an explanation? I furnish a game in which the observed positions are Nash equilibria, that, that configuration is a Nash equilibrium. A position, a strategic arrangement from which no perfectly informed, perfectly rational agent would unilaterally depart. So if God put people in those positions, no one would leave. But that gives no account of how the position could actually arise in a distributed population of cognitively plausible creatures. And I'm saying that's the idea of explanation that I think is interesting. And agent-based computational model is a central tool in producing explanations of that sort or models that satisfy that notion of explanation. So grow it in a population of cognitively plausible agents cognitively plausible agents. What, what are those? Well, cognitively plausible agents have emotions. They have bounded deliberative capacity, and they have social connection. And all of those things might matter in what happens at the individual or collective level. So I'm saying cognitively plausible, what are some minimum requirements of a cognitively plausible agent? Emotion, bounded rationality, social connection, all right? So Agent Zero is an attempt developed over the last really five years to produce an agent endowed with distinct, affective, deliberative, and social modules, each of which are grounded in neuroscience. These internal modules interact within the agent to produce often far from rational behavior. And when you put agents of this type together, then collectively they generate a wide variety of dynamics in fields of health, conflict, economics, social psychology, even law. So the idea, the objective of Agent Zero is not to perfect these modules, which I do not, in, I don't claim any expertise in neuroscience, <laughs> um, which, are, uh, which will be evident to anyone who reads this book. But, um, but the idea is get the synthesis started. Don't get the components finished. We'll worry about the components and people can help us improve those and by all means, let's all dive in and disassemble it and reassemble it different ways. 
but I'm insisting on a synthesis of some sort. I'm saying we have to have agents that, that exhibit these dimensions, however crudely. So it's a crude provisional synthesis, but it's a formal mathematical one, a formal computational alternative. So there's lots of criticism of the rational actor. You know, Kahneman, Tversky, Paul Slovic, all sorts of people have demonstrated that the canonical rational actor just doesn't look like homo sapiens. But a pile of gripes <laughs> doesn't change scientific practice. You have to have a formal alternative. You know, people will say, well, yeah, the, form, the rational actor has all these defects, but what, you know, what do we do instead? And I'm saying, okay, well, you can do this instead. Agent zero is a concrete, operational, mathematical, functioning alternative. Improvable, crude, all of those things, but it's formal. Um, so before laying out the equations that I want to just show you, let's just go to one example to get you, where are we going? What's the big picture of how this thing might work? So take, taking a, a familiar, if dark, interpretation, let's imagine agents occupy some foreign land. It's a, it's a landscape of indigenous sites, and there's a binary action the agents could take. Destroy my village or not. They're occupying forces. Experience on the landscape produces some disposition to take that action. And in particular, some sites are inactive, benign, friendly. Others are active, fear-inducing. They're attackers, ambushers, what have you. Agents develop an affective, they, they do associative fear learning on local stimuli. They associate indigenous sites with aversive experiences at a certain point. That's their affective component, and I'll use very simple equations of fear learning to generate that piece. They also take a local sample of what's going on around them. How many people in the neighborhood are actually attacking me? What's the likelihood that a randomly selected person is an enemy? So they have a, you know, and they make a, they make a non-Bayesian uh, relative frequency calculation about that. And that produces their solo disposition to retaliate on their neighborhood. But they're social animals, and they also experience a weighted sum of other agents' solo dispositions. And if that total exceeds a threshold, they take action. They destroy the village, they flee their portfolio, they refuse vaccine, they find guilty, not innocent, all sorts of things that we'll play with. But here's the basic idea, one, one example. So there's three of these agent zero agents, they're the blue agents, and they're connected by weights that we're gonna make endogenous throughout. The southwestern agent experiences no attacks from this indigenous yellow population. The northeast agents do. These are the orange illuminations that you see. That pushes them in the lower left uh, picture to over their threshold, and they retaliate, wiping out these villages, coloring them dark blood red, just to keep it gory and enjoyable. And then even though, this is the important point, even though the southwestern agent is never directly attacked, he, never ha he has zero probability that his neighborhood is an enemy, and he has no aversion to yellow people in his village. Through this process of emotional, dispositional contagion, he nonetheless wipes out his village. So let's just show a little picture of that for fun, and then we'll get back to business, just so everybody knows what's going on. So yellow landscape, some of them are aversive, some of them are benign. Everybody can see in their von Neumann neighborhood, they have local information. Oh, come on, drippy thing. All right, so in the upper, upper right, there's ambushes, these guys go berserk, but their berserkness makes the other guy wipe out his village, even though he's never been subjected to any attacks. He joins the lynch mob, but he's had, never had a bad experience with a black person, and no evidence of wrongdoing by any. All right, so this is the kind of behavior we're interested in. All right, so what's the real setup here? There's a binary action, flee the snake or don't, raid the icebox or don't, join the lynching or don't, what have you, okay? So when we talk about behavior in this setting, we mean a binary action, a zero or a one, okay? Agents are endowed with affective, deliberative, 
uh, modules, V of t and P of t. P of t is the probability on relative frequency grounds. V of t is the level of associative fear learning. It doesn't need to be fear learning. It could be disgust. It could be all kinds of other things. So I'm keeping it nice and general. Uh, and agents carry weights that are functions of time in their own right. And the person's total disposition to take the binary action is then their solo disposition plus the dynamic weighted sum of the solo dispositions of others. There's a threshold. Every agent carries some threshold. I usually just set them equal. So I think making them different kind of is cheating. You want people to, to act not because you've arranged different thresholds, but because of other dynamics. And the action rule, um, keeping things simple, of course, is that you act if and only if total disposition exceeds threshold. Right? So the idea, the whole thing is be, be minimal, be as stripped down and transparent as possible. I find if people ask me, you know, what's your field? The field, I would say, is generative minimalism. Um, longhand, they're updating their overall disposition, comparing it to a threshold, and acting if they exceed the threshold. All right? And it looks like linear superposition, but it's superposition of very nonlinear components, as you'll see, and it happens to be nonlinear. Okay, now, no one's actual behavior appears in this equation. It's other people's disposition that drive you, not their behavior, and that turns out to be important. Uh, the mechanism of action is not the imitation of observable behavior because the binary behaviors of others don't enter into this. Only the dispositions of others ent enter into it. And the reason, so we're suspending an assumption, overt imitation of observable behavior. That's not the mechanism. It's the non-observable <laughs> uh, that I'm interested in. Uh, and the obvious problem with imitation as a mechanism is it gives you no account of the first actor. If you're the first actor, there's no one to imitate. No one went before, so there's no one to copy. So how do you get the first person in the lynch mob? And I, I think just making it noise is cheating. Noise is, is not a mechanism. So this is a way of doing that. All right, the specific equations, all of this I should say on the Princeton web, in the book and on the Princeton website is everything. I've, th there's differential equations, there's Mathematica code. I wrote these things all myself in NetLogo. There's applets, there's source code. Uh, all the assumptions, so you can think it's all baloney, but it's replicable baloney from top to bottom. It's completely replicable, and for those who wish to pursue it, there's a very big code base there that's easily used for teaching and research and so on. The specific equations, and again, these are all up for discussion, are the, 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 the um, emotional module is a generalized version of a very famous conditioning uh, dynamic called the Rescorla-Wagner model, and I'll walk you through this. I just want to show you a snapshot of it. Um, the second one is this, you take a moving average of local relative frequencies, you're tracking how many yellow people, what's the probability of a yellow attack over some time window? And I could give people long memory or memory that decays, it could be a moving median. All of these are toggles in the code, you can choose anything you like. And their connection to one another, the weight, I'm saying is a kind of affective homophily. It's how much you feel like the other guy. What common level of fear do you and that person share? It could be probability homophily, it could be dispositional homophily, but again, the game is to wire it up in such a way that the weights are endogenous. They're not exogenous constants I put in the model. That kind of cooks things. I want the, I want to, why do networks happen at all? Why do they change? How are they dynamic? And if you make it an endogenous function of affect, then you see dynamics in network structure and in behavior and so forth. So those are the simple modules, right? I mean, in box one, an affective component. Tip, if you don't like this, great. Let's do something else. Temporal difference learning or a neural network or, you know, PID controller or whatever you like, some other thing. Uh, P of T, moving average of relative frequencies. Want to be Bayesian? Great. Want to make some people Bayesian? Great, let's do that. And the third component, their weights are a strength scaled effective homophily, but you know, you want to do something else? Great, I'm not wedded to the components, I'm wedded to the synthesis, okay? Or the, at least the synthetic impulse. Um, 
There's an ordinary differential equations version, then Mathematica code is all there and the rest of it. The subtitle of Agent Zero, though, is Toward Neurocognitive Foundations for Generative Social Science. And I talk about this a lot in the book, Generative Social Science. What is all this neurocognitive razzmatazz? What am I talking about here? So let's talk about the Agent Zero model in the fear instantiation, okay? Where the emotion in question is fear. Not, not, an, not an easy word to define and not one I purport to define very carefully, but let's build the model up uh, in that context. And obviously, it's centrally implicated fear in mass flight, vaccine refusal, uh, financial panic, Salem witch hunt, violence, stampedes, all kinds of things are driven by fear. And one of the areas, one of the complexes in the brain that is at least centrally implicated in this is the amygdala and the amygdaloid complex in general. Again, this is very, very crude. This is all from Joseph Ledoux's work on fear and the amygdala and Elizabeth Phelps and that whole community of neuroscientists. Um, and here are some pictures of the, the little creature. But the idea is in, that, that some of this uh, fear is what Joe Ledoux calls the low road, which is there's a, there's a sensory stimulus. It could be from the thalamus, auditory thalamus, or some other sensory system that sends a signal um, to the amygdala, which produces hormonal, blood pressure, freezing, all sorts of responses uh, of which we're basically unaware. It's automatic. I don't, if I throw a rattlesnake in Vonder's lap, he's not going to deliberate. He's just going to freeze. Then he'll deliberate and say, wait a second, that's a toy snake. This was just Josh being difficult. Um, but, but the initial piece is innate, hardwired, automatic, fast, be, beyond rational suasion. It's just what happens, and it's evolved to happen. That's a good thing in some co connections. And Donald Hebb famously said, neurons that fire together wire together. So this is an associative fear conditioning process, and an example of it, well-known example, is I put a shock cuff on someone's wrist. Uh, if, I just show, if I just show Wander a blue light, nothing happens. But if I put a shock cuff on his wrist and then pair blue light shock, blue light shock, blue light shock, after a while, if I just do blue light, I'll get recruitment to the amygdala and all the symptoms of the actual shock. And when this is a strong association, we talk about it as being a conditioned fear response to that stimulus. You have now come to associate the blue light, which initially was neutral, with an aversive experience, the shock, and the blue light stimulates the response normally associated with the shock, okay? And this pattern can be captured by these Rescorla-Wagner equations where the associative strength, V of T plus one, the associative strength on Tuesday is just the associative strength on Monday plus a learning rate times the maximum association minus the old learning rate, okay? So these little equations are the strength on Monday is the strength Sunday plus learning times one minus the strength Sunday. And I won't walk you through the arithmetic, save to say that it produces a very classical curve of associative learning, the acquisition of this association. Um, importantly, in the book and in the model, and I'll show you many, many runs soon, I promise, uh, I'm not, I don't purport to be modeling brain regions or brain tissue. It's not a model of a brain. Uh, the modeling is of an innate associative performance that is conferred by the neural architecture and explained by it, but I'm not modeling the architecture. We're talking about the architecture because it licenses this interpretation of unconscious fear association. So we can now explain what David Hume long ago observed. Um, after the constant conjunction of two objects, we are determined by custom alone to expect the one from the appearance of the other, having found in many instances that two kinds of objects flame and heat, snow and cold, have always been conjoined together. If flame or snow be presented anew to the senses, the mind is carried by custom to expect heat or cold. It is not by reasoning, moreover, that we form the connection. All these operations are a species of natural instinct, which no reasoning or process of the thought or understanding is able either to produce or to prevent. 
So I want this module to have that feature, right? It's non-conscious, it's inaccessible to ratiocination immediately, all right? And it conforms to a simple rule. Now, Op Ledoux talks about this as a survival circuit, and it's, op it's con conserved across vertebrate evolution in some form or another. <clears throat> and it's very valuable, okay? I mean, as I say, I mean, Pleistocene man never encountered a BMW, but we freeze when a car whips around the corner, just as he froze when huge animals charged from the tall brush. We're harnessing the same innate fear acquisition capacity, the same innate neurochemical computing architecture, but synaptic plasticity allows us to adapt that evolved machinery to novel threats like the BMW rather than the hippo, all right? And it's invaluable, but it's also very double-edged, right? If it lets, you know, light, shock, fear, right, but it could be Vietnamese face ambush and the My Lai massacre, or Arab face 9-11 and the presumption that, you know, the Quran is a terrorist field manual. Uh, Japanese face, Pearl Harbor, internment of the Japanese, 60% of which were American citizens. I talk about this in the book a little bit. Uh, doctors, the Tuskegee experiments, and then distrust of the medical establishment. MMR vaccine, autism, vaccine refusal, financial assets, sudden devaluation panic. Just, you know, just examples of processes where people come to be afraid of things based on shocking, salient events that are actually not very probable and so forth. All right, so another feature of this module is that you're supposed to stay afraid of hippos, right? It doesn't make any sense to be afraid of hippos Monday and then not afraid of them on Tuesday. Or agents that had that attribute are, so, are not observed, right? I mean, they're selected out. So you need to be, to stay afraid, so the extinction of fear may be quite a ways off, all right? And you can, in these equations, produce an estimate of the half-life of fear and play all sorts of enjoyable games with the equations. But the idea is fear is not necessarily conscious and it doesn't necessarily go away when the stimulus stops. And the full effective trajectory looks like this. And in animal studies, it also looks like that. And I guess what I would say is we do not fear what the rat fears but we fear how the rat fears, just to be controversial. Um, so one component is fear, all right? Another component, but I'm saying in the model, we're saying, look, it's contagious. There are these weights. People can catch the other person's fear. Okay, well, that's dandy, and I have a, a mathematical paper in PLOS1 called Coupled Contagion Dynamics of Fear and Disease, where there are two dynamics, a disease epidemic and a fear of the disease epidemic, and they interact in interesting ways. And that's all dandy, Josh. But is there any neural license for that, any basis for that? So yeah, very interesting work by Ethan Cross that I'll come to. But again, observational fear conditioning. Let's go back to our original exercise where I'm fear conditioning wander to the blue light, blue light shock, blue light shock. And this is his amygdala, I should have said, this is just a, an fMRI of uh, blood recruitment to the amygdala. Again, a million things you can say about this. You should have all kinds of skepticisms about it, and I do. And there are single unit recordings and many other ways to, to think about this and many other areas that are implicated. And the amygdala does all sorts of stuff that isn't about fear. So it's not a mechanical picture, but it's, it's, there's some functional specificity that's worth noting. So here's the amygdala response after blue light shock, blue light shock, blue light alone. But what's interesting is, the lower picture is of someone who was not wearing a shock cuff at all, but simply watching the conditioning process. So I'm not wa getting shocks at all. I'm just watching Vonder get shock, blue light shock, blue light shock, and you show me the blue light, my amygdala lights up. So <laughs> there's acquisition of fear without direct stimulus, and that's experimentally, you know, I, I think that's a strong, um, strong scientific, there's a literature on this that I think warrants the modeling assumption that you can catch other people's fear, as in financial panics and so forth. All right, so after all of that, the first ingredient is emotion. Reason, as Hume said, maybe a slave to the passions, but what about uh, reason? There is some reasoning going on in addition to this emotional chunk, but typically we have incomplete and imperfect information. We make systematically erroneous appraisals of it, 
And there is a whole literature of robustly documented errors. The representative heuristic, base rate neglect is a great one, anchoring all sorts of well-established departures from canonical rationality and Bayesian reasoning and the like. And accordingly, my agent is not Bayesian, but is it just a primitive local relative frequentist, okay? Um, I think of the agent as purposive, because he wipes out something he doesn't like, but I don't think, I, I, one, one thought is to, is to think of this as an ortho-rational agent. It's not an irrational agent. It's not like he figures out the right thing and does the wrong thing. It's that a lot's going on that it is orthogonal to the computation of an optimal behavior. So that you can give this agent, you know, some sort of, he's a convex combination of the rational and the irrational. And if I dial V to zero, I can recover something that looks like the rational agent. And if I dial to one, I can recover or produce something that's really more on the emotional scale. So it would be interesting to noodle around with, with that spectrum. Okay, so we have a primitive picture of emotion, a primitive deliberative module. To make matters worse, <clears throat> agents driven by strong emotions like fear, doing bad statistics on incomplete and biased data, also influence one another. And conformist pressures can then produce widespread convergence on counterproductive behavior. And conformity effects have been documented in many spheres. Again, is there a neural basis for that as a modeling assumption? And very, very interesting work by Ethan Cross and his colleagues, uh, published in PNAS, are all about rejection, social rejection. And their conclusion in that article and their, their imaging studies and the rest is that when rejection is powerfully elicited, areas, brain areas, that support the sensory components of physical pain secondary somatosensory cortex and others become active. And they've done interesting fMRI work. What they put people in an fMRI and they show them pictures of the spouse who left them, the kids who ditched them, the team that kicked them off, the friend that abandoned them, these other things. And they get, again, you know, the areas that are recruited are those associated with actual physical pain. So it hurts to be a nonconformist. They write, these results give new meaning to the idea that rejection hurts. Rejection and physical pain are similar, not only in that they are distressing, they share a common somatosensory representation as well. So I'm gonna say, okay, I also feel some license to give people weights that they can experience the emotions and dispositions of other agents. And we'll generate this in the model. But given these components, the logic of the model is the agent acquires a disposition not through imitation, but by these other deeper processes. There's a threshold, and if the disposition exceeds that, they take action. All right, so let's show you some runs. We have three agents occupying this yellow country, yellow or passive, orange or ambushers. They condition on that to develop a level of fear. They also take empirical data from their local neighborhood and make a relative frequency estimate. They add those and then the weighted sums of the other agents are added in. So here's, here are the agents on their yellow landscape. The uh, northeast sector is where all, everything bad is happening. This agent in the southeast is never attacked. The, his, his immediate data is, nope, nope, I have a relative frequency zero. Nobody ever attacked me. You know, left to his own devices, would you be afraid of these yellow people? Nope, nothing. On his own, he wouldn't do a thing. All right, but let's see, let's go right to the, but because of the others, this is the movie I showed you before. We'll just go quickly. He wipes out his village anyway. So this is sort of the My Lai massacre. <coughs> Why, and I call this the, the condition humaine, um, that's a pun on the word conditioning, of course. But. Why does he do that? He does it because total disposition is greater than threshold, even though solo disposition is not. On his own, he wouldn't do that. And in fact, he's negatively disposed. On his own, he really would not be negatively disposed. And the most, I think in many ways, the central run of the model is the next case, where despite being negatively disposed, the agent acts first. He's the first agent. Okay, 
He's negatively disposed, and he's the first to act. So not only does he join the lynch mob, he leads the lynch mob. And to me, that oh, I, I call all of these computational parables, but I think that's a core parable, that the agent goes first without direct aversive stimulus, and when alone, he wouldn't do anything of the sort. So is it leadership, um, or is it just susceptibility to dispositional contagion? Um, there's not, it's not behavioral imitation, because there's nobody to imitate. He's the first actor, and is he the leader, or is he just the most susceptible to dispositional contagion? And I agree with Tolstoy on this, who wrote in the book, I have a lot of Tolstoy, actually, um, that a king is history's slave, performing for the swarm life. He's got this beautiful writing about the swarm life of man and the swarm history of man. Um, this is an unsettled, I hope it's an unsettling picture. I think it's rude to read from your own book, but I'm going to do it because it's one instance of reasonably good writing. Anyway, so the overall picture of Homo sapiens reflected in these interpretations of Agent Zero is, I hope, unsettling. Here we have a creature evolved, that is, selected for high susceptibility to unconscious fear conditioning. Fear, conscious or otherwise, can be acquired rapidly through direct exposure or indirectly through fearful others. This primal emotion is moderated by a more recently evolved deliberative module, which at best operates suboptimally on incomplete data and whose risk appraisals are normally biased further by affect itself. Both affective and cognitive modules, moreover, are powerfully influenced by the dispositions of similar, equally limited, and unconsciously driven agents. Is it any wonder that collectivities of interacting agents of this type, the agent zero type, can exhibit mass violence, dysfunctional health behaviors, and financial panic? He asked rhetorically. All of that is implemented along with many, many extensions and interpretations of the model, a few of which I wanted to show you. Um, fight versus flight, all sorts of things, economic dynamics. I tried to grow a little toy Arab Spring, jury processes, um, real price dynamics, and so forth. So let's go through a couple of those. One instance I showed you is the fight response, where given the aversive stimulus, you wipe out sites in your neighborhood. But another response could be flee the neighborhood. So here are our three agents. And in this case, you know, one of them <clears throat> is, is recalcitrant, the upper right one. And they're thinking, man, this is terrible. This is a pollution. These are refugees, OK? This is the refugee crisis, if you like, all right? I, I think would be a very ripe uh, topic for exploration along these lines. All right, and this other guy really wouldn't leave. He doesn't want to go, but they drag him out. Come on, man. Let's get out of here. <laughs> this is a model of Los Angeles. This is a complete three-dimensional replica of LA with all the structural engineering correct. Uh, there's another kind of evacuation. Um, buildings are color-coded by function. Some are hospitals, other, other sorts of things. The traffic is color-coded by velocity, the higher, the, you know, yellow highest, purple lowest. Uh, and there's a complete orthodox uh, aerosol. You could think of it as a toxic plume that you will see. So this is a synthesis of computational fluid dynamics, engineering, all these buildings are actually correct, and their permeati permeativity to this gas is correct. And there's agents adapting to this, this crisis. So this is published in PLOS 1. And it would look great on Wander's three-dimensional projection system, would be a very immersive way of studying. If you slow this down, it could be a model of climate change or environmental impact or so forth. But it's another situation where agents can react to an environmental shock in a convincing three-dimensional reconstruction. So the environment piece is real physics. The buildings are real engineering, and traffic is real engineering. But the behavior could be fear-driven, you could ask, you know, tell people to shelter in place, but they run out of the building. 
trying to get their kids at school, uh, and they produce tremendous congestion and more exposure to this plume than they needed to endure. So here's some other views of this. And it's the kind of integrated environmental engineering, behavioral modeling that, that I'm doing with colleagues in engineering at something called the Systems Institute at Johns Hopkins. So this is a fertile area to apply our trade and populate these kinds of models with more cognitively rich agents. Here's the upper left is what you saw. Upper right is looking down on this plume as it moves around. Lower left is another view. And then the measure of merit for the whole exercise is number of agents exposed and the level of exposure in parts per million per second. So we compute that as model output. And then under different intervention strategies or evacuation <laughs> strategies or what have you, you can see the effect in actual exposure to this plume. Okay? So that's one where a place where you could now populate a larger, more realistic model with, with agent zeros. Another area is infectious disease, which I'm happy to say that, you know, agent-based modeling really has transformed the way large-scale infectious disease modeling is done everywhere. So that's, I think that's a win for us as a community. Uh, here's a U.S. Uh, run of our U.S. model. This has 300 million individuals. Uh, it's correct in its distribution of ages, household sizes, schools. Um, it even has hospitals and things that doctors might care about. Uh, and we did a lot of these runs for NIH for pandemic and CDC and the like. Here's a classic run for swine flu on, on sort of acceptable parameters. Uh, black is healthy, red is sick, blue is you either died or recovered. So you can plug in your own case fatality rate, but they want incidence. So here's a run. This starts in LA also. In my modeling, everything bad starts in LA. Because I'm a New Yorker, so. So here's one run. And you could say, you know, the, this, we've, you know, my colleague John Parker has been the lead software engineer on this. And these run, this a year epidemic, you know, they, they run in about 10 minutes uh, in parallel Java code that he's developed and we've published in Tomax. Um, so you can intervene. You can say, oh, what if I wanted to close schools now? What if I wanted to ban flights now? What if I wanted to distribute antivirals now? What's the optimal mix of interventions? Um, and we have a planetary scale model. This has 6.5 billion software individuals. And this, of course, would look smashing on your global display system. And we should think of a way to export this model output to that visualization. Here again is H1N1. Um, and again, the idea is let's put more plausible agents into these models. I mean, we have the infrastructure that will accept a more sophisticated agent and use it on problems that are of you know, considerable moment. And this is the only you know, planetary scale agent-based infectious disease model. There may be settings where you don't want an agent-based model, of course. I mean, once the level of saturation is sufficiently high, then okay, continuum dynamics might be perfectly fine. Use a mean field approximation and, you know, it's differential equations above some level of saturation. But early on, when network structure matters, the agent model might be crucial in giving you some sense of whether the thing will take off or not. Okay, now a lot of, a lot of these behaviors, uh, in, it, there's literature on behavior in epidemics, but I call these models, they're homo economicus models. It's like, what would homo economicus do in, if he were sick? And they require a lot of uh, information and optimization and so on. And there are lots of cases of prevalence independent epidemics that are very naturally generated in agent zero. I mean, Salem witch hunts, I mean, for, for those of us who aren't superstitious would agree there are no witches, right? So it's all, there is no prevalence of witches. Um, that's a minority view, of course, but uh, networks are implicated. Let's talk a little bit about that. How do network weights change? The book explores lots of cases where weights matter, like revolutions, juries, but there is this basic question, why do networks happen at all? Why do networks happen? 
And one thought is, well, let's make them happen because of affective homophily. They happen because people feel similarly about something. All right? So you could try just the difference in affective level. Um, that's not good because it equals zero when they're identical and strong. You don't want that. So, okay, let's take one minus that. That's, that's okay, except two duds with passion zero have the same strength as two crusaders with passion one. Okay, so let's try a strength scaled homophily, which is what I've been noodling around with, all right? And when you put it that way, it turns out you can generate networks and powerful alliances and the rest. So here's the same stimulus pattern on the right of regime corruption. The orange, orange uh, sites are acts of nepotism, terror, vanishings, pr imprisonment without trial, all the normal stuff. Uh, but with no communication, everybody's very angry. Their affect is very high, but their disposition to rebel is low because they don't have any allies. When you let them have freedom of cyber assembly or whatever you call it, then they can generate a jasmine revolution, as we saw. Again, these are very crude caricatures, but they point to the importance of communication in emboldening people to act on what are, in fact, their beliefs or feelings. And I think one of the interesting things about the Arab Spring and about Occupy Wall Street and the rest of the things is, <coughs> excuse me, they're, they're revolutions without any Mao Zedong or Lenin. There's no leader in the classical sense. I mean, they really are much more bottom-up uh, events, and I think that's a stunning and interesting development. Jury dynamics are another one. Here the landscape is, uh, here's the O.J. Simpson trial. Uh, the stimulus pattern on the lower left is just you're in the public square, you're hearing all sorts of stuff about OJ, you don't know the other blue agents yet, you're just forming your own judgments about his guilt or innocence. Then you're impaneled as a jury, and in the upper right, you get a different stimulus pattern of barristers, all right? And then you adjourn to the jury chamber where you're finally allowed to talk to one another. And what happens, again, this is just a result I think is interesting. Here's phase one, they're just a collecting data Here's phase two, and then in phase three, when they're all together, they unanimously convict, okay? But the history of their feelings and dispositions is this. During, it's a 90-day trial with three 30-day phases. Uh, on the right, everything up to the time where they're selected to be on the jury, they're forming their opinions, but their net disposition, that is their disposition net of their threshold, is less than zero. Oh, it's just, well, that, let, no, I think threshold is one. Okay, so let's do total threshold against, I, I apologize, total disposition against an action convict threshold of one. So on the basis of the public square only, they would not convict, none of them would. They're all below one. Then in the trial phase, they're not communicating with one another yet, and they're hearing arguments now, a different pattern of data, if you will. Their dispositions grow, but they still wouldn't convict. None of them would convict. They'd un unanimously acquit. But then they go to the jury chamber, and through these affective homophily dynamics, they all end up, they come out of the room with a unanimous conviction. So the idea is they universally betray themselves. It's not just I lead the lynch mob, but everybody in the jury has this, or is in this order. No jurors would have convicted before the jury phase but they're unanimous in rendering a guilty verdict, having interacted directly. So again, imitation could never generate that, something else going on. Uh, why do networks happen? This is easy, you just put a threshold on the affective, uh, affective homophily, and if it exceeds something, you make a link, and if it's below that thing, you take the link out. It's just introducing uh, a link threshold for the weights. All right, and you get different structures as a function of the threshold, uh, and you could think of it as a kind of Poincaré map of the underlying affinity dynamic, but it's, a, it's a big, again, a big departure from the literature of preferential attachment. It's attachment on 
homophily and is degree independent, where most of the literature, a la Barabashi and Albert and other very fine scientists, is um, that it's really about preferential attachment. And it's a testable hypothesis. So you see networks happening. This is the strength, uh, is the, the width of the linking line is the strength of the connection. So networks happen, they fall apart, they reassemble, depending on the stimulus pattern and the shared emotional experience. And you can even make it a, a, an economic model by letting the threshold be price dependent, and then you can generate crude cycles of demand as we see in you know, many, many data sets. Crudely mimics, crudely mimics the data. Uh, okay, so I'll wrap up by saying <coughs> science begins as parable and ends as probability. We can talk about that. But the core parables for Agent Zero are that the creature is subject to emotion, bounded rationality, social connection, joins, even initiates action despite negative solo disposition. And examples are financial behavior, violence, vaccine refusal, obesogenic eating, fight versus flight, we look about that. I replicate a very famous experiment, the Darley experiment, where people leave a smoke-filled room uh, much sooner alone than they leave it when there are unresponsive confederates in the room. Uh, jury dynamics, networks, economics, many other extensions are explored and proposed in the book. But the idea is here is a neurocognitively grounded agent capable of generating a wide range of important social phenomena that is a mathematically explicit functioning alternative to the rational actor. And I thank you. Thank you. Thank you.